Welcome back to Shattering Myths. As we turn the page and consider the Torah in the midst of uh, a world that has been so misled, is so misguided, it's important to closely examine and carefully consider the reason why Abraham serves as the model for our merciful father, as the model for the enriching father and therefore for Yahweh himself, and why it was that Abram, who became Abraham, benefited from the covenant so that we ourselves might come to understand the statement that Yah etched in stone, uh, delivering not only the two tablets, but also his Torah to Moshe when he said that thousands will be the beneficiary of his mercy, and it will be those who closely examine and carefully consider those who observe the terms and conditions of his covenant contract. So here, if you want to know how you can also be a beneficiary of the covenant, listen to these words. And so, Abram, which means father who uplifts, actually and continually walked Halak, relationally and beneficially Asher, consistent with Ka, Yahweh's words to him, the bar El. I'll read that more quickly the second time through, and then I will explain how we came to that translation. And so, then, Abram actually and continually walked, relationally and beneficially, consistent with, in the same manner as Yahweh's words to him. So, if you want to be in the exact same place that Abraham is, if you want to be a beneficiary of the covenant as it is being manifest before our eyes through this discussion and relationship with Abram, what might you want to do? Hello, Larry. Welcome. Uh, my guess is you probably can answer that question. Well, yeah, you, you, you might want to engage in the covenant. You know, yeah. and, and should you do that, uh, uh, the first thing you're going to do is the same thing Abraham did. You're going to walk out of Babylon, which yep. is where I live today. You know, yep. I mean, I, it surrounds me. I'm, I'm no longer a part of it, but uh, yep. it's pervasive. Yeah, that's the first thing he asked of, uh, of Abraham is to walk away from Babylon, which uh, Yahweh goes into great lengths to tell all who will listen that Babylon is this cesspool of religion and politics, of militarism and jaundice economic schemes. It's, it's what we witness uh, in most countries today. Um, certainly in America, it is pervasive. It's pervasive in, uh, in the Christian religion. It's pervasive, of course, also in the Islamic religion. And it's, uh, it is a condition that continues to exist. Yes, Babylon was once a country, but it had a very short life. And yet, Yahusha, in his revelation to uh, humankind through Yahukanan, tells us that even before, immediately before his return, he is still Walk out asking, of Babylon, he says. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Walk out of Babylon. Yeah. And so it is a condition that, that most people still find themselves in by way of the religious and political uh, Christmas that, that they adhere to. Yeah. Christmas is a example. Babylonian holiday. It was conceived in Babylon, as was Easter. The worship of a Lord might be another good one. Yeah, right. exactly. So in this particular statement, you, uh, you have some very interesting uh, uh, verbs. The two uh, verbs here are, the first one is walk, halak. It was described in the call imperfect. The call stem says this is something that is literal, this is genuine, this is actual. So he actually walked. He genuinely walked. This is something that was that was uh, uh, not being conveyed uh, by way of, uh, of of a hypothesis, but something that was real and actual and tangible. He engaged. He walked. Now, the imperfect speaks of actions which are ongoing. So he continually walked. It wasn't that he took one step and stopped. He took one step and stopped, or ten steps and stopped, or even a million steps and stopped, it would have had to be inscribed in the perfect. But it's in the imperfect, which means that his walk 
and his willingness to engage with Yahweh was continual. It became the part of the fabric of his life. That's how he traveled through life. Now, the walk is an interesting term. Yahweh could have chosen any one of, uh, of a thousand different verbs to express why it was that Abram was included in the covenant. But he chose walk. Now, walk is an interesting term. To walk, can you be down on your knees? No. No, so you can't be bowing down to a Lord and walk, can you? Oh, I could walk on my knees, but it wouldn't go very far. Yeah. Have you ever seen anybody worship somebody while they're walking on their feet, or do they, you know, when you're, you're no. groveling again on your knees when you're doing worshiping? No, no, I've never seen no. that. No. I've when, seen them uh, stand still and hold their hands up in the air. I've seen them when, do that. You when know, you're walking but, with someone, you're going somewhere? Yeah, you are. Yeah, you are. And in this case, you're walking away from Babylon, walking to the promised land, walking with Yahweh. Along You're actually path. engaged in doing something and working. You know, I mean, that's that's the whole point here. That's, that is the most important point. You're on your feet, you're engaged, and you're going someplace. So walk conveys all of those things. You're on your feet, therefore you're not in a religious mode, in a worshiping mode. You're, uh, uh, you know, you walk with friends, you walk with companions, you walk with family. When you're walking, you're exploring. So that's part of it. Part of it is you're moving someplace. This is all about, you know, the path that Yahweh has provided. Even the seven invitations to meet with him provide a path from our polluted Babylonian world to God's home. And so you're on your feet. You're going someplace. You're engaged. All of that is conveyed by walk. And this was written in the call imperfect, which says that that walk is genuine, it's actual, and it is uh, continual. So, and so Abram actually and continually walked. And then this word Asher, it's uh, one of my favorites. Uh, it's, yeah, relationally. Uh, yeah, it's, yeah, Asher has two meanings. Uh, it's, uh, it's when it is used as a, uh, uh, as a kind of a combined preposition and pronoun, it, uh, it draws a connection between things. It, it relates things. Um, and so it is a relational concept. So he walked relationally, made a connection between his walk and Yahweh's words, which is the next thing we're going to uh, to hear. But that's when it's used in as a uh, as a grammatical uh, tool. Asher also uh, is a noun that conveys beneficially, advantageously, fortuitously. And so if you are to fully amplify Asher so that you get the full benefit of the term, it's that he walked relationally and beneficially. Now, how did he walk relationally and beneficially? How did he genuinely and actually walk relationally and beneficially? The next uh, word is one that appears quite frequently in the, uh, the Torah, not nearly as frequently, however, is, of course, Asher. But it's ka. Ka means consistent with, in the same manner as. Uh, if you were to make an, a, a, a connection between things, an equivalency between things, that his walk was beneficial and relational because it was consistent with whatever follows. What follows is Yahweh's words. But Yahweh's word here, and it's Yahweh's name here, written yod Hey wah Hey, and we'll speak to that in just in a moment, but <laughs> word was, uh, the bar, was written as a verb, not as a noun. Now, the bar appears an equal number of times in uh, the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms as a noun and as a verb, written the same way as a noun and a verb, but here it's being deployed as a verb. Now, the only difference in a verb and a noun is a noun describes something, uh, a thing, typically, or an individual. You know, it's, it's, it's descriptive of something, defines something, and a verb is de depicts an action. So, what God is saying here by writing that word as a verbal form is that he says that, that his word is actionable. 
and the the action of his word is to walk relationally and beneficially with him. Right. Can, can I interject something here? I just, uh, it, you know, and, and people, people the, the misdirection of religion is what I want to get at here. Mm -hmm. Ma many people here are going to say he walked with with Yahweh. Okay. Yada. He walked with mm -hmm. them. That means he was moral. He was pure as the driven snow. He was holy. He was in constant and consistent prayer. He was, you know, and they got this list of nonsense. Okay. Right. And, and the truth of the matter is, is that at this point, what we're what, what we're seeing here is that Abraham, Abraham is trusting Yahweh, and beneficially for Yahweh and and for Abraham, he, he's going to have a forever covenant. That, that's what we're going to get to here. Yeah. And and it's because he's listening to Yahweh's words, <laughs> which yeah. is something people of faith and people who are holy. Do not do. Uh, he, there's, there's do two, not do it. Right. There's there's two essential elements to uh, to this um, relationship. One is that Abram listened to Yahweh and then he responded. He acted yeah. upon. He acted upon Yahweh's words. The reason word is written as a verb is because Abram acted upon, responded to those words. He's not yabbering at Yahweh. He's listening to Yahweh and then responding. And even when he talks to Yahweh, it's in response to something that Yahweh has said to him. Uh, a very important aspect of, uh, of all of this is just to come to know what it is that God asked and what Abram has done. Now, it's interesting that in this discussion, never once does Yahweh ask Abram to pray to him. Not once. In fact, God doesn't ask any of us to pray to him anywhere in the entirety of his Torah. God, God never asked Abram or any of us ever to worship him. He did not ask Abram or any of us to be religious. He did not ask Abram or any of us to show obedience to human institutions. Never once. Every aspect of of religion. He's opposed to does encourage. Welcome back to Shattering Us. We're talking about a extraordinarily important line in the Torah that helps explain how Abraham became a member of Yahweh's covenant family, and therefore how you and I can engage in the covenant and be part of God's family, and therefore, as a result of that relationship, be saved by him. There's something extraordinarily profound at the end of this statement that speaks in opposition to what the Pope said yesterday. Let me read the statement again, and let's discuss it. And so, Abram actually and continually walked, relationally and beneficially, consistent with Yahweh's word communicated to him. With word being written in a verbal form and thus actionable. The uh, living, corporeal manifestation of Yahweh's word is uh, whom, Larry? Yahusha. There we go. And so what Abram did is he walked in a manner that would have been consistent with the actionable representation of Yahweh's word. His walk, Abram's walk, therefore, was consistent with Yahusha's walk, which is why he's in the covenant. If you want to follow Yahusha, if you want to walk in his footsteps, then your walk has to be consistent with Yahweh's word. Now, where do we find the first tangible expression of Yahweh's word? Where Yahweh's word is manifest to us so that we can hold it, read it, look at it, examine it, consider it, recite it, 
Well, we see it in, in Bereshit, which is uh, in the beginning, yep. which and, uh, in a is book called Genesis what? in a religious book. But, uh, yeah, and, and, and that's the first book of what? Of, uh, of the Torah. <laughs> right. So the first tangible expression of Yahweh's word, of Yahweh's word literally manifesting itself in the life of uh, his covenant family, is in the Torah, correct? In fact, we're reading these words right out of the Torah. That's right. And so it is the Torah of Yahweh, his teaching, his guidance, and the living manifestation, the corporeal manifestation of his words, which is the Osha, collectively being one and the same, that we emulate, that we acknowledge, that when we are consistent with, then our walk is beneficial and it's in a relationship with Yahweh. And so this Pope, by saying, you know, uh, that uh, Jesus led us to the promised land, no, not only was his name Yahusha, which means it's Yahweh who is leading us, and not only is Yahweh, Yahusha, the living manifestation of the, the actionable form of Yahweh's word, it's when you walk in that same path that he walked that you're led to the promised land. Yeah, and, and you know, covenant. it's not like we have to guess at that. The, the entire, the, the covenant writings are full of it. You know, they're, they're out there, they, the son of man, uh, you know, has the Torah in his mouth. He's the living embodiment of the Torah. He rests on the seventh day. So if somebody doesn't, you know, look at the seventh day, understand it, uh, live it, if, if, if somebody doesn't uh, take Pesach as an example, how are we going to have a Pesach lamb? Or, I, I know I can't make a Pesach lamb today, but I can sit down and I can eat lamb, and I can right. break matzah bread, and, and I can put that matzah in a, in a bitter herb, and I can eat it, and I can drink red wine, and I can understand the symbolism of all these things, can't I? Yes. But 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 the corruption goes from what? It goes from a, a, a Pesach or a Passover dinner to the Lord's Supper. Everything's got to be a counterfeit. So we know that Yahusha was was following what? The path of the Torah. Yes. And yet he yeah, said, well, I actually said, yeah. I will put my words in his mouth. Whose words? Yahweh's words. It was it not Abraham that was walking relationally and beneficially consistent with the word of Yahweh? And so if the word of Yahweh is in the mouth of Yahusha, wouldn't your walk be exactly the same as Abram? And wouldn't that mean that you'd be walking away from Babylon and that therefore you'd be uh, uh, leaving religion and politics behind you? That would be true. So how could you be a Roman Catholic and pay any attention to this? You could. You couldn't. You have to walk away from Christianity, from Islam, from socialist secular humanism to walk with God. That was the prerequisite for participating in the covenant. And then to enjoy God's company, he asked us to walk with him in accordance with his guidance. We'll be back in a moment. who may have a, uh, a copy of uh, this chapter, which is uh, free for anyone who would like to uh, read it. The chapter that we're providing this commentary from is is in the first volume of a book called Yada Yada. It's available free at yadayada.com. When you're looking at Yahweh's name, as it uh, was written in the alphabet that he used to etch it in stone and to introduce himself to humanity, there is a... Uh, a marvelous pictorial presentation of this uh, idea of walking uh, continuously, relationally, and beneficially uh, in a manner consistent with Yahweh's word. The name is uh, written with four letters, as you know, Larry. Um, the first letter in Yahweh's name, yeah, the first letter in Yahweh's name uh, suggests being consistent with someone, following someone, because it's a, 
upper arm reaching down, a forearm reaching out with an open hand. You know, when you're, you're walking hand in hand with someone, you're walking in a manner that's consistent with him. You know, well, I, them. I, I, I see it, uh, that, that can be there, I, I see it as an invitation. You know, when somebody reaches out their right. hand to me, it's, right. it's for me to take that hand to shake right. it. You know, right. it's, it's, yeah, to shake it, to grab hold of it, but but it's also as a father, it means uh, when a father's hand reaches uh, down and out to a child with an open hand, he, he's there to lift them up. When you're reaching out your hand to someone you care about that in your life is because, you know, you, you want to walk hand in hand with them. Um, but it's also a way that we guide people. We guide people, we lead them with our hands. That's the first letter in Yahweh's name, but it's the next two, or two of the next three letters that are so uh, consistent, so uh, symbolic of this idea of walking uh, with Yahweh. Because it depicts two people, the Hayes in Yahweh's name, two people that are standing up on their feet. Their, their legs are not, uh, feet are not together as if they're standing, you know, uh, at attention uh, and, you know, ready to salute someone. No. Their, their legs are apart. You know, their, their feet are apart. They're at parade rest there. Yeah, man, know? yeah, they're, they're moving. They're walking. They're engaged. And these two people are shown with their, uh, their, uh, hands, they're pointing up to God. It's the, in fact, the, the Hebrew word that is, uh, that is the basis of the letter He means, Hene, it means, uh, behold, look up, notice, pay attention. They're paying yeah, attention. And you point up. out yeah. that those two people are probably Sarah and, and, and yes. Abraham, and I think yes. that you're right. I right. think that is right. right. Yeah. It just represents the the nature of Yahweh's family, and, and because his name embodies his purpose, which is to establish this family, and the family was established through two individuals, uh, Abraham and Sarah. And Sarah's name is in what? Yes, Sarah. The heart, yes, Sarah yes, the heart, right. It's the heart of uh, Israel. So you've got an Abraham, the merciful, enriching, and empowering, uh, uplifting father, which represents Yahweh, and Yisrael, you find his children. Uh, Yisrael is individuals who engage and endure with God. That's what Israel means. Sarah means to engage and to endure. So, ish, individuals, Sarah, to engage and endure, El with God, is, is the object of Yah's attention. The purpose of his word is to lift us up. So I think the two individuals standing represent the covenant and, and that they are representing uh, Abraham and Sarah, but they depict two people standing up, walking, looking up, reaching up to God and his, uh, his open hand as it is offered to us. Between these two individuals is uh, is uh, something that uh, most people have a tough time identifying with. It is a tent peg. But every time you find uh, Yahweh and Abraham uh, uh, settling down to, to have a long talk, to uh, enjoy a meal, uh, to engage together, it's always uh, in sight of, in front of, Abraham's uh, home, which was a tent. This tent is described uh, many places because our lives today and our families today are in temporary uh, residences, and that's conveyed by this tent, and it's a protective covering. It is the tent peg that makes the tent possible. Without the tent peg, the tent cannot be secured, can't withstand the elements, and it cannot be enlarged. The more secure the tent peg, the larger and more secure the home becomes. And it's through these two individuals standing on either side of the tent peg, which conveys uh, a great deal more than just making the covenant larger and more secure, because the wa in Hebrew is actually the most common word throughout the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms, the wa. It means in addition. It, uh, it is the connective word in Hebrew, very much like the English and, but it speaks of to add to. And so what's the purpose of the covenant? God adding to our family. lives. Yeah, adding to his family and enriching his children, adding to his children, making his children more than they would otherwise be. 
That's Yahweh's name. Yahweh's and we all name. need that, by the way. Uh, right. Yeah. Yahweh's name. And interestingly, interestingly enough, I had a debate yesterday with a fellow that told me that he only stays in the Torah. As an example, Yermayu was a fraud. Oh, I said, okay, so Yermayu was a liar. And uh, he says, now, you can't show me anywhere that anyone other than Yahweh does any anything. And I said, that's right. And that's why Yahusha means Yahweh saves. But since you don't accept him, I said, do you accept uh, Malachi? Do you, do you accept Zachariah? Do you expect, you know, accept Yahshua? Yah? He wouldn't answer. So so I said, well, let, let's go to words here to Dabarim. And and I showed him that I said you're you're real big on using he didn't use Elohim he used Elohim with an A, which which is fine I don't have a problem with that, but uh, you know I, I showed him in Dabarim where where it, it says Yahweh declares here Sama uh, Yisrael uh, Yahweh our mighty ones as in Elohim the plural of Almighty was is and shall be Haya one unity. God. But uh, right away, he tried to go to a cod and say it didn't mean one unit. I said, well, sure it does. That's exactly what it means. Right, so, you know, what, you know. When, when Yahweh spoke through um, Yirmiya, which is Jeremiah, uh, Yashaya, which is Isaiah, Malachi, which is uh, messenger, Malachi, uh, Hosho, which means salvation. When Yahweh spoke through Zechariah, which means to remember Yah, uh, Zechariah, when he spoke through these uh, prophets, Yahweh speaks in first person. They record Yahweh himself speaking in first person. Now, Yahweh said, you know, I don't want you to be troubled trying to determine uh, or wondering where are you can rely that I am the source of the inspiration of the words and where the individual is falsely claiming to speak for me. For example, Shaul, Paul, falsely claims to speak for God. There is a test that Yahweh provided in Dabarim, in Deuteronomy, uh, yep. in 13 and 18, that delineates how we go about determining absolutely as to whether or not it is Yahweh who is providing the testimony or man that is providing the testimony. And the tests are, are interesting. There's a, a number of aspects to the tests. One is if they uh, speak in the name of, of, of other gods, like the gospel of grace, that they aren't speaking for Yahweh. So Paul would be disqualified. If they make a prophet, if they do not make a prophetic statement, which is the test, then they are not speaking for God. If they make a prophetic statement, one or more, and anything that they have prophesied does not come true, they are not speaking for God. If they make prophetic statements and everything they say happens exactly as it was revealed, then they are speaking for Yahweh. Paul, of course, made uh, two predictions, one about a shipwreck and one about... Uh, the, uh, the timing of what he called the Harpazo rapture, the violence snatching away, he was wrong on both accounts. So God provided us the means to, to know these things. In Yashaya, Isaiah, and in Zechariah, uh, Jeremiah, both books are absolutely jam-packed with predictive testimony. Everything that Yahweh had has predicted, has either come true, or as on the cusp of coming true, will happen within the next 20 years. And is now a fait accompli. So obvious that it's going to occur. And so God has proven that he authored the books that uh, your um, advocate, uh, not advocate, but your adversary in that debate, uh, wanted to discard. Also, if you look at Yosha's words, well, we must be careful because they are they are all translated. Yosha spoke primarily in Hebrew, but some Aramaic, which is a cognate language of Hebrew. And uh, at the very best, his uh, words were then translated into Greek, which does a very poor job of representing the uh, the Hebrew train of thought. 
Uh, and, and then they were butchered into English. And well, their not, copy yeah, of yeah, not just butchered into English, very, very in, inaccurately translated uh, and misrepresented into English. But the, unlike the Torah and the Prophets and the Psalms, where there is at least a, a reasonable amount of fidelity between the original, the oldest manuscripts and what we, uh, we have access to, today, and the Dead Sea Scrolls have demonstrated this, that it's about one in 14 words that's differ, and we can, can go back and fix most of that by examining the Dead Sea Scrolls. And, and, and that's, that's if you're using an MT, but if you get into right. an English-translated Bible, well, that's that is story. Yeah, it's even story. far worse. Far, far worse. But in the, when it relates to the so-called Christian New Testament, if you examine the oldest manuscripts, of which there are 69, and you compare them to the, the uh, either the Texas Receptus or to now the Nestle Allen, there are over 300,000 known discrepancies between the oldest manuscripts and the, uh, and the text that forms the basis of the Christian translations. And therefore, you really have to be careful with what you read because the it's a mess. It's highly unreliable, what you find in the so-called Christian New Testament. But... What you do find is that there's almost nothing that Yahusha said that wasn't previously conveyed in the Torah, Prophets, and Psalms. And so there is a way to verify what he communicated to us because he's communicating the word of Yahweh as conveyed through his Torah and Prophets. of shattering this for today. There is uh, another insight that is worthy of our consideration in this uh, statement. The statement from uh, Yahweh is found in the opening book of his Torah called Barashit. It means in the beginning, 12.4, and it reads, And so, Abram actually and continually walked relationally and beneficially, consistent with Yahweh's word to him, the bar L at the end. We uh, examined, Larry, that uh, the reality that walk, halak, was written in the call imperfect. So the call imperfect speaks of it being genuine and actual and perfect ongoing. The, the actionable nature of Yahweh's word was not written in the imperfect nor in the call. Yahweh deliberately changed both the stem and the conjugation. In this case, the conjugation was the perfect. What the perfect means is totally and completely. In other words, we're finding here that Abram didn't cherry pick parts of Yahweh's word and say, you know, I'm going to act upon that, but I'm going to ignore this. That's kind of like Christianity. You choose and you pick and choose what you, you like and don't like, and, uh, and you uh, uh, go with uh, whatever it is that uh, you, um, you think. And in this, it's written in the perfect. It's the totality of Yahweh's word to him. So the, the perfect is says that Yahweh's testimony was completely conveyed to Abram. In fact, it's interesting that Yahweh actually says that he provided his Torah to Abraham. And it's very possible. He didn't have to provide it in a written form. He could have conveyed it verbally because Torah means teaching. So, it's written in the perfect, which means that Abram's walk was consistent with Yahweh because he did not uh, uh, pick and choose segments of something, but it was the totality of Yah's word, the completeness of Yah's word. The second is that it was, it was written with the peel stem. Now, all stems denote a relationship between the subject and the, uh, and the object relative to the action of the verb. The peel stem has the subject influencing the object of the verb. So the word of Yahweh is, has Yahweh as the, as the subject, and it has to him, El, as the object. So we have Yahweh influencing Abram relationally and beneficially through his word. It, uh, the peel stem is often uh, conveyed in Hebrew as, uh, as Larry flew the plane. 
with the plane being the object, Larry being the subject, and uh, and flying being the action. You influence the the direction the plane flies by your input. Well, here Yawas is the subject of the sentence, and the word is the, the communication of the verb is the verb, and the object is Abram to him. And so here is Yawa is influencing, directing Abram's walk so that it is relational and beneficial just as we would fly a plane. He's directing him. He's guiding him. That's why Torah means to direct, to guide, to instruct. Powerful combination. And that's why it's so important in when we're considering Yah's word to recognize that he chose Hebrew to convey his message. Now, you don't have to be able to speak Hebrew. You don't have to be able to read Hebrew to understand this. In fact, you're almost better off not being able to speak it and read it because if you can't speak it and read it, then you've got to use an interlinear, which takes the Hebrew and sets it next to the English, and then lexicons or dictionaries, which then define the Hebrew, uh, and particularly tools that, that convey the grammatical stems and moods and uh, conjugations, so that you take the time to look up each word, so that you come take the time to think about what these stems are conveying, what what are the conjugations conveying? And you know, if you just simply read it, you might miss all of that. Well, so, it's, you know, it, it, it's important, too, because what we find in languages is that languages devolve over time, just like everything. Yes, they do. And, and they don't devolve, they devolve. Right. Uh, as an example. Words one lose of the, meaning, and yeah, their well, meaning uh, is, is degraded over time. Yeah, so so if you get somebody that says they speak Hebrew today, they don't speak Paleo Hebrew. No. No, the language has evolved over time. Larry, one of the things that I love about you is you have figured out a way to make your speech, your responses, always consistent with Yahweh's word. And you do that by quoting his words. It is a good lesson for all of us. May Yah bless. Look forward to being with you at this time tomorrow.